This podcast is brought to you by North Carolina's Electric Cooperatives. This is NC Spin, an unrehearsed discussion on issues of interest to North Carolinians. Now, here is your moderator, Tom Campbell. Thank you for tuning in, NC Spin. This week has been another interesting one in North Carolina, and your NC Spin panel has balanced debate for you. We'll talk about record enrollments and changes in our state supported universities. We'll discuss another redistricting lawsuit, and we'll ask what is the real purpose of redistricting? And of course, next Tuesday is Election Day, and we're going to try to fit in some of the more interesting municipal races that are going to be going on during that time. But of course, the panel's going to tell us something we don't know. Speaking of which, this week's panel includes Peg O'Connell, communications and healthcare consultant, John Hood, syndicated columnist and author, Chris Fitzsimon, who's the director of the newsroom, and Rick Henderson, the editor in chief of Carolina Journal. We'll begin our uninterrupted debate after these brief messages from our underwriters. From treating the newest member of your family to helping a loved one make end of life decisions, your family physician is with you every step, for every stage of life, for every member of your family. Despite a healthcare landscape fraught with potential landmines, family physicians across North Carolina are providing you a lifetime of committed, dependable medical care. Family Physicians, your trusted healthcare advisor for life. Life's busy, but you're in control. As an electric cooperative member, you have access to lots of tools to help manage your home energy use and budget, so you can focus on what's most important. NC Spin is brought to you in part by the North Carolina Farm Bureau. The Farm Bureau and Agriculture. We keep North Carolina growing. Before we get started, I want to start by thanking my old friend Brad Crone for sitting in for me last week. Well, our state-supported universities have reported record enrollments this fall, but off-campus events are also grabbing headlines, and we want to talk about them along with the search for a new president of the UNC system and other issues facing our state-supported universities. Peg, UNC President Bill Roper reported this week there were almost 240,000 students enrolled in our 16 campuses this fall. That's a record. At a time when other universities are seeing declines, we got record enrollments for the second straight year. Roper says he thinks it's because of more accessibility, unparalleled educational opportunities and more affordable costs. Is he right? Well, I think he, uh, in large part, uh, President Roper now, I guess we call him, is is right. Um, I think you've seen uh, a, a big increase in the enrollment at the NC Promise schools, Western Carolina, Pembroke especially was way Elizabeth up City there. State's going crazy. And uh, as yeah. well, so that's good value. You also have a guaranteed tuition for the four years you enrolled that started a couple years ago. I think one of the big drivers, though, of this increase in number is the number of young people who are staying in college. So the while the overall new enrollment from high school graduates is down a little bit. It's the kids who go into college and are staying in college Not that are out. driving the numbers. And I think these tuition programs are helping them. Good point. Uh, our universities are looking for a new president. Uh, Bill Roper was frequently mentioned as a leading candidate for that job, but he took himself out of contention, uh, saying he wanted to try to help bring some stability and calm to the situation. Uh, I think we could say, uh, being the kindest, it's been a controversial period, period here recently. He says he's going to stay until next June. Can he be more effective now that he's withdrawn? It may help him that now that he's a lame duck. I think it certainly should uh, light a fire under the selection committee to choose the new president. And by choosing to leave when he did, uh, it, it really does make that m much more urgent. There are things that, that Bill Roper can attempt to do and try to get done as quickly as possible. And uh, his, you know, as I say, having the end date in, in sight is something there. But I think it was a big surprise that he actually announced that at that time. I want to ask Chris and John both. Uh, there's some saying that he did this because he knew he was not going to be a permanent candidate for the job. But there are a lot of people who thought uh, that Bill Roper did this because he genuinely thought this was what was best for the universities of North Carolina. Where are you on this? Well, I think he made it clear early on that he did want to be the permanent uh, 
UNC president. I think he was hurt some by his lack of uh, filling out the forms on ethical disclosures correctly. Although, if you really get dig deep into that story, he had told the board when he was named as interim president about, about his board the, memberships, yep. but he didn't fill out the forms exactly right. I don't think it's a stretch that there are some folks who uh, d didn't want him to be the permanent president who may have played some role in that story coming out, but it's a legitimate story. He didn't fill the, the forms out correctly. I think he's one of those rare folks who has this, he's a Republican. He worked in the Reagan administration. The Democrats generally seem to like him and think he does a good job. Uh, I think it's unfortunate that he's not a candidate because I think there aren't, there aren't many people in this polarized time that have the support of, of both parties. Bill Roper has dedicated a lot of Absolutely. years of service, not only on the national level, but also on the state <clears throat> level of North Carolina. Where are you on this issue? Well, I, I assume that there was an interest by Dr. Roper at some point, and perhaps it became evident that wasn't going to happen. But I want to emphasize the fact that this could be a good moment for the university during the search process to have someone who is not a, not a candidate. So I, I take Chris's point about his qualifications and ability, but there could be some value, and as that's sort of what our, uh, Bill Roper was articulating, that during the next several months, it, uh, through the beginning of the year, as the search process continues to the middle of the year, to have someone who can bring some uh, stability and effective leadership to a situation that has been chaotic. It has. I, think, well, I think it's worth pointing out the last president that we selected was Margaret Spellings, who was a Republican who worked in the Bush administration, who was well thought of by conservatives. She was not the choice of the Senate leadership. They preferred Peter Hans. It's not a secret. Uh, when, those, when he was not selected, the members of the board who were on the search committee who selected Margaret Spellings were not reelected to the Board of Governors by the General Assembly. That, those are the facts. And that Margaret Spellings had a communications. I think the board did not do her a service and let her run the university the way she wanted to. That is a red flag, I think, for a lot of people around the country. She's very well respected, and she couldn't make it work. Back to the situation with Roper, though. I, I'll have to tell you that uh, I, I think he did an honorable thing. I mean, we don't see that much in public life anymore. I think he stepped down because he s stepped away because he said, you know, the, we need to calm this place down around here and we need some stability. Well, Harry Smith also said he, he, he thought that that episode made it much less unlikely that he would get the job. I'm the biggest Bill Roper fan in the, at this table, but I do think he knew that he was not going to get the job. Uh, it, it may have been, okay. but the, the end result was I right, think he did right. an honorable thing. Speaking of Harry Smith, Harry Smith also stepped down, uh, rightly or wrongly, has been at the center of a lot of this controversy. Um, the Board of Governors waived their rules, elected uh, Randy Ramsey as the new chair until next June when elections take place. Do you think Ramsey can bring some more stability to the Board of Governors? Well, I hope so. I mean, he knows that things are in a state of uh, upheaval, if not chaos. So I think that should be his main focus. And I think he just needs to let things settle and focus really on bringing in a new president who can manage this university through the next several years, as opposed to this sort of daily, uh, what university leader is going to leave us now? And I want to talk about that in a minute. John, I want to talk about the Dan Gerlach situation. We can't, we can't avoid that. Everyone at this table knows Dan Gerlach. We've known him for many years. Uh, he was the interim chancellor at East Carolina. Last week, there were pictures of, of him published in a bar in Greenville, drinking with students. Dan admits that it probably wasn't appropriate behavior, uh, but he's trying to be more approachable to his students. Uh, differentiate between appropriate behavior and impeachable behavior, John. Impeachable? <laughs> well, I mean, not being thrown out of it, being, being thrown out of his job. I didn't mean, I didn't mean impeachable. But, all right, go ahead. Well, I don't think he should have been negotiating with Bella Russia for the you know, campus <laughs> or whatever right. he was trying to. If get. you start talking about and Ukraine, and we're I signing off. I, I chose to say Bella Russia. Okay. Right. I know it's Belarus, by the way. For all you Belarus. Uh, viewers, I know I was just sort of kidding. It's <laughs> Belarus. Go ahead. Back right. to my question with Gerlach. So what I would say, of course, Dan is, is a longtime friend of mine, but I put that on the table and, and say, by his own admission, this was a bad decision that he made. So this is not a question of, well, let's defend whether he should was trying to be approachable. He, this was not the right way for him to become an approachable leader at ECU was to go out uh, that late on a weeknight and situate. It just was a bad idea. He knows it was a bad idea. He said it He's was a bad idea. He's admitted it. Yeah. Yeah. But now the question is the photos um, depict some of what was a bad idea, but also apparently a particular young woman who was there 
who apparently had been accosting other patrons in the bar. She was ultimately ejected yeah, from the bar. thrown out because she was dead and drunk. And I just, I just want to point out that pictures like that don't always, sometimes we say pictures worth a thousand words, but sometimes you need the words to explain Chris, the situation Chris, better. Chris, there's some people that are thinking Gerlach was set up, that they were just looking for a way of, of campaigning against him and, and yeah, discrediting him. Dan sort of referred to that a little bit in a statement he made on a radio show there. I don't know if that's true or not. I do know that that, that has been a very divided community since Cecil State and the former chancellor uh, left. Uh, I do agree with John, and I've known Dan for, I don't know, 25 years. Yeah. Uh, worked with him for a long time. I think Straight that, arrow guy. I think that uh, it wasn't a good idea to go to the bar. Go to the student store where their kids are buying books or go to some other campus activity. It's probably not a good idea to be drinking with the students. On the other hand, the owner of the bar, other patrons at the bar, seemed to make it clear that those pictures that painted him in an extremely unflattering light were very misleading. I don't think I don't think he did anything. I don't think he did. Uh, he behaved as inappropriately as it as being as the perceived, pictures make it. But yeah. it probably was. It was not a good decision to go to the bar. I, there's no question about it. Uh, uh, so far as it goes, let's get to the search committee business. Uh, the board of governors has appointed Kim Strack, uh, who used to be chair of the state board of uh, elections, uh, to be the staff for this new search processes. Uh, I, I want to go around very quickly. What advice would you give this search committee? Look for someone not currently in North Carolina to come in and run the system. Interesting. There are a lot of people who would say we ought to limit it just to North Carolinians. I think North Carolinians are uh, too polarized about this issue right now. Interesting. I, Chris? Well, normally I would agree with that, but we've done that twice. Molly Broad and Margaret Spellings, neither of their terms worked out at all. In fact, they were both, in, in effect, forced to leave. So I, I want to agree with Rick on that. Uh, I think the biggest struggle is figuring out a way to negotiate the, the politics of the people who elect the Board of Governors. How do you make find someone who's acceptable to them and also acceptable to the larger university community? I think Margaret Spellings did a good job opening up herself and the community finally embraced her, but she wasn't conservative enough or didn't, didn't do what they wanted her to do. It's a very tough, tough, tough John, job. John, there are a lot of people that are saying, you know, for years, traditionally, we've searched for presidents, we've searched for chancellors that come out of academia. Uh, there are a lot, number of people saying that this job demands uh, business knowledge, it demands administrative skills, it, it, it demands uh, administrative skills, and they cite Dick Spang Spangler and Erskine Bowles as good examples of leaders that we've had at the university. Does it have to come from academia? Well, it doesn't have to come from academia, but I just want to kind of challenge the, the, the dichotomy you're presenting that someone's either from business or they're from academia. Actually, C.D. Spangler and Erskine Bowles, right. they had significant experience with universities Spangler and various Spangler had been capacities. chairman of the Mecklenburg schools. Yeah, the that's also true. That, that's also yeah. true. But my point is that you can have experience, you can have feet in multiple, you know, camps over the course of a career. Uh, I do think someone who has no experience with how universities are governed at all is probably a bad idea. But someone who has spent their entire life in universities, probably also a bad idea. But you, Peg, you, you've hit on something that I thought was a, a good point and probably needs to be underscored. The recent presidents that we've had have, have had tenures of around three years, four years. Uh, there are some who are saying we need to find someone age appropriate who could spend between five and ten years in this job and, and really be in a situation of knowing it and understanding it and being able to do a really good job. How important is that? Well, you know, I don't know, Tom, that it, age has anything to do with it. And my uh, short advice to the search committee is to call Tom Ross and beg him to come back to the university. <laughs> um, but I think you need someone who's got the intestinal fortitude to, to stick through this difficult time. I mean, the Senate's not going anywhere. They're going to continue to create this sort of tense situation for a leader. You've got to have somebody who's willing to stick it out. That's people who are like three years, I'm leaving, I'm going, I don't like you anymore. That's not the way you lead a university, a community or state or a nation. So they need to be apolitical? Or is such a thing possible? No, such a thing is not possible once you've reached that level of uh, you know, professional development in almost any career you go into. You've got to have some political acumen. And I think that, uh, I mean, I take Peg's point very well that it, you need to have someone, and Chris's as well, you need to have someone who's able to figure out how to be acceptable to the people who 
pick you for the job, but also can be acceptable to the university community at large. And that's going to be a very difficult task, and that's, again, why I was suggesting someone outside the current fray. Well, there, there's another way to think about that balancing act, which is a, it's a balance between the, the board being just sort of laid back and submissive and let the president determine all the agenda and everything, which arguably happened before this period, but the current situation, they overcorrected, and now the board is so actively involved in managerial decisions. I think we need to talk with whoever the new person is needs to have a clear sense. They are being hired as a leader. They aren't going to be the only source of information for the board. They're going to have other forces. They're not going to be led around. They're not going to be able to lead the board around by the nose. But they also are going to have a board so constantly second The days, the days of a, a UNC Board of Governors who essentially were fairly quiet. Yeah, just go to the, go to the receptions and say yes. That's a bad idea, but that doesn't mean that an active board uh, constantly questioning everything is, is a good idea. So, Chris, uh, Roper has said he's going to stay till June. Mm -hmm. Does this search committee have time to identify, uh, recruit, yeah, hire so. and I mean, get a new president in by June. I think so. I mean, that's you know, that's a. Good, I think they do. They've they've already started. I hope that they do. I think that is a legitimate time frame. In fact, it, him saying that's his date sort of gives us a deadline and gives us a, a plan uh, and a timeline to to meet. So I think they certainly can do that. I have Tom F Ross's phone number. I'm happy to give it to. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, are you a paid staffer, by the way? No, no, yeah. but he was a good leader of the university, and what happened to him was wrong, and but that, that was the that beginning would, that would of... just stir it all up again. I, I understand what you're trying to say, but this we need a fresh, fresh start on this story. Yeah, yeah let's let, let some sleeping dogs lie here, too. <laughs> uh, so the, uh, this past week, uh, Purdue University's uh, president, Mitch Daniels, who's former governor, came to the Tom Lambeth series for public policy and spoke about higher education. He cautioned that higher education has some of the greatest challenges uh, at this moment ever. Uh, he says that at a time when tuition costs are soaring, there hasn't been a corresponding rise in the quality of education, and that grade inflation is a, pro a problem, but more importantly, that employers are beginning to look beyond transcripts when they are hiring. Is that a valid criticism? Absolutely. That's, that's the case. I mean, the, the four-year bachelor's degree has replaced the high school diploma as the minimum standard that many employers look for in job applicants. And that's a shame because that really indicates that the value of a high school diploma is not what it once was. He also made the point that pretty soon college, uh, colleges are going to become playgrounds for the wealthy, essentially, because no one's going to be able to afford to go to a decent college who isn't already rich. And I think those are very valid points that, uh, that Mitch Daniels made. What he's done at Purdue is in line with many of the reforms that the Board of Governors has done here at the UNC system. He's kept tuition under control. He's done a lot to maintain retention levels. I mean, the, the problem with the Board of Governors at UNC quite often is they can't get out of their own way. I was they, getting they, ready to say they've done some good stuff, <laughs> but there's been so much controversy yep. involved with it. We didn't focus on that. We The good stuff, we focused on the controversy. Right. Peg, uh, Daniel said that in academia, diversity uh, among students, enrollments, faculty, it is just a prime topic. He says that in addition to that, maybe we need to be thinking about more diversity of thought on our university campuses. React to that. Well, you know, I mean, I think there are, well, and the Pope Center is a big part of this, um, that there is a feeling, I don't know that it's true, but a feeling that our universities are bastions of liberals um, polluting the minds of the young. And uh, there, but I think everyone needs to be able to feel free to speak their mind and give, my favorite teacher when I was an undergraduate was so terribly, terribly conservative. We had nothing in common politically. You but made brilliantly conservative, don't you? Every Isn't word that, what you that came out of his mouth terribly. was brilliant. <laughs> and he formed me in my political thought, not in reaction to him, but in that he was such a good thinker. And if he hadn't been such a good thinker... And, and good thinking will always be good thinking. It will. Yeah. And, and a good articulator of thought. Let's switch topics here. We're eagerly awaiting the verdict by the three-judge panel as to whether the legislative districts that were recently drawn are going to pass muster. We also learned this past week of another lawsuit, this one challenging the congressional districts. But former UNC President Tom Ross, who you've talked about, 
chairs North Carolina's for redistricting reform, wrote an op-ed piece that questions the real purpose of redistricting, and I want to talk about that. Rick, let's begin by checking on the progress of the maps the legislature drew and submitted to the three-judge panel. We know this special master, Nate Persley, is reviewing these maps. Any news on when we can expect to get some sort of verdict here? Well, actually, while we are taping this show, it's possible that the defendants uh, from the legislature will have filed their brief responding to the court's original opinion. And so uh, we're now in a you know, process where it's probably going to be several weeks, unless the court decides very quickly, that, uh, that they're going to accept the uh, you know the rejection of the of the of the what the uh, common cause plaintiffs re- uh, objected to, who didn't object to the Senate maps at all, by the way, objected to the House maps because the House used uh, incumbency as one of their standards. But I think that when it's all said and done, Nate Persley is probably going to be drawing the maps. And the question that we well, raised this get, week is, yeah. what kind of process is he going to use? I want to get to this, but I, before we do that, let's talk about this new lawsuit, the congressional redistricting lawsuit. Some people are saying this is just a Me Too lawsuit. Um, these congressional districts have been challenged before. They went all the way to the Supreme Court. What was the verdict there? Well, I mean, the, the issue is the Supreme Court basically said that extreme partisan gerrymandering is not unconstitutional under the federal constitution. And they, but they said this is up to the states. But a lot of people took that to mean that the states on legislative districts, which is what happened in North Carolina, uh, the state's court, the three-judge panel, which is the case that Rick can, is talking about, found that that was true and ordered them redrawn and were in that process. The question is, can the state order federal districts redrawn because of extreme gerrymandering. The state court may find that, then it's gonna go to the federal courts and we'll see what happens. Uh, But I don't think it's unreasonable, as a citizen, if it's unreasonable in your state that they use extreme gerrymandering to to, uh, gerrymander legislative districts, then why then would we not take a look at congressional districts? And remember, David Lewis said the only reason we have 10 Republican districts in an evenly divided state is that we couldn't draw 11. They clearly are extremely gerrymandered. The question is, is that unconstitutional? There's some some confusion about this that should not exist. Uh, Of course, the state constitution applies to federal congressional districts. It is always applied. It will be applied here. It is very likely that if the same three, and the same three judges are gonna hear this case, and so the theory is not different for federal districts and for states. They're exactly the same. In fact, that's what's true in Pennsylvania. The, the, and I'm, again, I'm not arguing that this is a good idea, but the Pennsylvania Supreme Court made a decision about how the state constitution curtailed gerrymandering of congressional districts. That's what the decision was about. Let's get back to this legislative districts, and I'm sorry if I'm hopping around too much, but the, the, this special master seems to be the one who's going to ultimately make the decision whether we keep the maps that the legislature drew or not. One of the things I find this interesting is uh, we get upset when the legislature draws districts that we think are gerrymandered. But do we then want to turn around and turn this over to one person? Which is what Nate personally would end up being. Well, part of the issue with, with whatever happens with these maps is if the court orders Nate personally, if that's what happens, if he orders Professor Pers- they order Professor personally to use the same guidelines that were stated in the original opinion, which are largely guidelines in the Stevenson case, which basically says the maps have to be compact, they have to be contiguous, they ha- I mean, all those sorts of things. If, he, if he's a l- limited by rules in a very strict way, then that's a good thing. But it's also, an algorithm. but yeah. is it going to be transparent and open? And that's the big question. I, I, I'm, I'm running out of time and I apologize for it because it deserves more than what we're going to be able to give it. But we talked about Tom Ross earlier. This op-ed piece uh, that, that he's written on this process, I, I thought was very thought provoking and, and stimulated some good questions. And quite frankly, I'm going to bring it up and we're going to talk about it in a future show. But one of the things that he talked about in here was he said, this process, the, the legislative process, was more transparent. It was more bipartisan. Uh, it, but he said the biggest criticism he had was that it protected incumbents. But he said it was a, a meaningful improvement from the past. The, he said that the new districts are still going to lean Republican. But he raised the question I think is intriguing. Should redistricting consider partisanship? Or do we acknowledge partisanship and draw maps? according to whichever party you belong to. Yeah, he, he was making a point about they're gonna, there might be a slight tilt right now because of the way the geography of voters is that it's not an intentional partisan bias, and he's right about that. 
Yeah. And I think, and that's what the court said, intentional partisan bias has to be taken out of this. And so I think what Judge Ross, uh, the way he crafted his article, um, I work in the legislative process. It's all about the art of the possible, and this is what's possible. Well, the art of the possible right now is that I'm going to ask each of you in two minutes to tell me something I don't know, Chris. <laughs> I have two minutes? You, no. <laughs> oh, no uh, interesting. Well, you, you can mean, have two you, minutes <laughs> after the show signs off. <laughs> yes. Interesting that the uh, we mentioned Randy Ramsey is the uh, new chair of the Board of Governors. He's the first chair of the Board of Governors that I recall who did not graduate from a four-year college. Four years, so he does not yep. have a university degree. Uh, been very successful in business. Yes. Uh, the state battle over the farm bill will continue, and more than likely, we're going to have this settled in federal court. All right, Peg, tell us something we don't know. Two new businesses have opened in Farmville this last couple of months. Uh, Lenoka Coffee, which makes a mean home. Uh, you know, I feel like I'm back home. at Lake Wobegon. <laughs> Where is Garrison uh, Keeler when we need him? 30 and seconds, and John. A bakery, and a bakery. If you don't like first in flight on your license plate or first in freedom on your license plate, you can now get first in fly eat, F uh, L Y eat, which has a picture of a Venus fly trap eating a fly. First in fly eat on your license plate, if you wish. At least it's not an emu. I've got to emu? talk to yes. you about the fact that October 25th is Rufus's Super Kids fundraiser. I'll, I'll give you more details next week. Well, you've heard our spin on the issues of the day to stay informed all during the week. Sign up for our free weekly email newsletter. Give your feedback and read my weekly column. Visit our website, ncspin.com, or catch NC Spin on Facebook. While on that website, subscribe to our podcast. And until next week. Be sure to stay informed and watch out for the spin. From treating the newest member of your family to helping a loved one make end of life decisions, your family physician is with you every step, for every stage of life, for every member of your family. Despite a healthcare landscape fraught with potential landmines, family physicians across North Carolina are providing you a lifetime of committed, dependable medical care. Family Physicians, your trusted healthcare advisor for life. Life's busy, but you're in control. As an electric cooperative member, you have access to lots of tools to help manage your home energy use and budget, so you can focus on what's most important. NC Spin is brought to you in part by the North Carolina Farm Bureau. The Farm Bureau and Agriculture. We keep North Carolina growing. North Carolina Channel is made possible by the financial contributions of viewers like you who support the UNC-TV network.